All right. Well, I guess we can get started if everything's ready. So, uh, welcome to our worship service today. Good to see everybody here. Really awesome that uh, Rondia and Mia are back. Thank you for picking them up and bringing them here. Anyway, um, we've got volunteers to do the scripture reading and to do the uh, hymns so you don't have to listen to me try to sing. So I guess uh, I could not find a volunteer to do this sermon for me, but uh, um, I guess I guess we can just get started. I'll, I'll do a quick prayer and we can start. Our Father in heaven, I thank you so much that uh, you brought us together here today for the Sabbath and uh, we'd like you to come among us with your Holy Spirit and fill our hearts with your love and your truth and we just like to let you ask you to accept our worship today and we thank you for uh, everyone who's here and the people who have, we haven't seen in a while showed up and uh, just like to ask you to uh, be here with us today lord in your name jesus amen All right, thanks, Leland. And please stand while we sing our first hymn, Majesty, on the second page of your bulletin. Hello, everybody. We're going to do our scripture reading, John 10, 27 through 33. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I am the, and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered to them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Let's go ahead and bow our, our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing us together today. I pray that you would be with everybody that is here and that can't be here today. I pray that um, you would keep everybody healthy. Please um, bestow your peaceful and loving spirit upon us. Um, join us today as we learn more about you. And I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the confusion before that song. You'd think by now I would know the order of our service. But anyway, I like both of the uh, hymns today. I think uh, Philip picked the crown of thorns, didn't you? Crown of Counter with many crowns, yes. But uh, that sounded like a fairly recent one, and and but it's not like a lot of the most recent ones you hear, uh, because this one's all about God and His glory. And a lot of recent hymns are all about you know me, 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 you know and how awesome it is to be loved by God and all that, which is, and, and it's nothing wrong with hymns like that. Uh, one of my favorite hymns is uh, one I've been had stuck in my head lately a lot is uh, it, it is well with my soul that I like the ones that focus on God's glory and that's one of the reasons I picked majesty and I assumed majesty was actually an older hymn like a lot of the uh, English language hymns that were written like probably between 1880 and 1920 or something, uh, they focus on on how awesome God is. But then uh, when I picked it, uh, Linda mentioned that, uh, no, that was uh, written by a guy named Jack Hayford, uh, who was pastor of a church, a famous church called The Way, and that he wrote it while he was pastor there. And so it's a recent hymn too, but it's all about 
God and how awesome he is. Anyway, it's all about God's glory, which is what our sermon is about today. Um, while I was researching this sermon, I, I came across a uh, little tidbit of information I didn't know before. Give glory to God is actually a Jewish idiom. It was at the time of Christ as well. And basically what it means is confess your sins. So you're confessing to God, admitting that he is God, you owe him your obedience, you have disobeyed, and giving him the glory, hopefully for forgiving you. So... Um, that's basically what our sermon is about today. Oh, basically, the uh, subject of this sermon, I kind of inadvertently talked myself into uh, at one of our recent Sabbath schools when we were, or not Sabbath schools, our Wednesday night Bible studies. Uh, when uh, they said, the issue came up of how often the, uh, there, how many times in the Bible did Christ actually say, um, that he is God. And I had heard that there weren't that many. While I was researching this, I found out there's more than I thought. I mean, he doesn't say it always in those words, I am God, but he says it clear enough. A lot of those verses are, are in the book of John, which we are studying at our Bible study every Wednesday night, and that uh, our scripture reading was from today. Uh, there are others. There's some in the Old Testament. Uh, I think I mentioned one uh, before. It is in the uh, book of Revelation, where uh, Christ is saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. He started everything that exists besides himself. He co-created the universe. And uh, I'm not going to I was going to do a sermon, just go through all those and talk about them, but first of all, that would have made the sermon even longer than I usually go. And you guys can look those up easy enough for yourself. I wanted to focus on just a, a couple in particular. One was, you know, John 10, 27 through 33, which, you know, Jessica read for our, or no, I'm sorry, Priscilla read for a scripture reading. And there are others. But in, it turns out that uh, in John 10.30, Christ was actually reiterating that he's God. He, uh, he had said it before, like the chapter before, if you go back to uh, John 9, 13 through 41, I'll start reading through this and we'll talk about it because I think it sets up um, his claim to be God and uh, what, it, what it cost him and what it will cost us eventually, what it cost his disciples. Anyway, uh, let's just start at John 9, 13. And uh, this is where Christ had uh, immediately before that healed a, blind, a man who was blind from birth. He uh, made you know some clay with his spit and some uh, dirt, rubbed it in his eyes and said, now go wash in the pool. And he did, and he was able to see. So at 13... They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. They were talking about Christ there. But others were saying, 
how can such a how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs and there was division among them so they said to the blind man again what do you say about him since he opened your eyes and he said he is a prophet the jews do not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the man, the very one who had received his sight, and questioned them, saying, Is this your son, who says, who you say was blind, born blind? Then how does he now see? The parents, his parents, answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees we do not know or who opened his eyes we do not know ask him he is of age he will speak for himself and here's the the good part well not good interesting part his parents said this because they were afraid of the jews for the jews has, had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be christ he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. And by the way, there are other places in the Bible where, where this happens, but we have to be careful not to do this. The only reason he, they said that uh, they didn't know who healed him or who that person was it's because they were afraid of the repercussions. And even, you know, if any of us have, some of us already had to face that dilemma in some small way to lose esteem from other people when they find out that we are a believer. And I think it might not be that long before it could cost us a lot. It costs some people around the world and always has, cost them their life to stand by their faith in Christ. But we are called to do that, and we need to do that no matter what. Anyway, let's go on. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. There's that, that, that verse or the, were those words, give glory to God. They were calling on him to tell the truth. It was their idiom for like, we might say, God's honest truth. And really, I'm telling you the truth. He then answered, whether, is, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, I now see, which I'm kind of scratching my head, because he... I don't think he believed he was a sinner, uh, Christ was a sinner, even though he didn't know him that well yet. But I mean, you'll see why I think that as we go on. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples, do you? At this point, they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as far as this man, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if, but if anyone is God-fearing he and does his will, he hears him. Well, that, that's the verse that makes me scratch my head about verse 25, you know, when he said, well, I don't know if he's a sinner. But anyway, if we go on a little longer, I won't make you read the whole Bible, I promise. We know that God does not hear sinners. This is the man talking again. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. 
since the beginning of time, it was has it never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you are teaching us, so they put him out. So the Pharisees were kind of haughty, I think. Anyway, uh, some of you notice like in your Bibles, there's like headings for certain sections. And that's not actually part of the Bible. It's just, I guess it's a commentary. Or, But uh, in my uh, Blue Letter Bible, the next part, 35 through 41, has one of those headings. The heading is, Jesus affirms his divinity. So this is the part we're looking for. Jesus heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He's talking to the formerly blind man now. He answered, Who is he? Who is he, Lord, that I, that I might, may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking to you. So that's one of the places where Christ says, he is the Son of Man, Son of God. And then the man responded by saying, Lord, I believe. Called him Lord. Then the next part of the verse is, and he worshipped him. And if you read on, you'll notice that uh, he said that. Well, how did Jesus react? Jesus was a Jew. I mean, he always said he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Every tittle of the law was still the law. And the Jews, their law was, if you blaspheme like that, you got stoned. And Jesus did not respond to this when he said, when he went to Christ, by saying, all right, let's blaspheme. I'm going to get some stones. We've got to take care of this guy. He didn't do that. And there's uh, one or two other places. Doing that, that he is God. So, let's read verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. That kind of, uh, kind of cryptic there, but I mean, I think it means that uh, you would find that who would see and who would not. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. So they could see. They could see what Christ did. They could, you know, they could tell he was God, but they refused to acknowledge it. John 10. Because uh, right into my blue letter Bible heads that section, Jesus asserts deity. So verse 22, at that time the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe me. 
the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And then it goes on to verse 27 that Priscilla read for us today. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Well, what about us? Do we hear his voice? I want to. I try to. I try to not uh, let his voice get drowned out in the hubbub and confusion of the world, but sometimes it, I let it. You know. What about verse 25, where it says, the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify to me. Do the works that he is, does in the Father's name convince us? Christ didn't just say that he was God repeated in the New Testament and even in the Old Testament. Christ showed us by his works that he is indeed God. What Christ, you know, look at the resurrection. Look at the resurrection. Christ changed history, I mean, profoundly. If you look at the arc of history before Christ died and was resurrected, and look at it afterwards, a lot of things that just never were before. It you know has taken time since his death for the world to catch on, but the world has changed. Look at how women are treated these days. When Christ came to the earth, I mean, women were just, they were chattel almost, even, even among the Jews sometimes. One of the most profound, world-changing verses in the Bible, I think, is, is where we men are commanded to love our women and devote our lives to them. It's talking about both our women as our wives, our close family, our mothers and sisters. Also just, you know, women in general. Look, slavery. No one has ever been able to pinpoint a place in history, secular history anyway, where slavery began. It's just always been part of the world. Christianity ended it. That, that, that just amazes me. Anyway, Christ did claim to be God, our creator. He proved that he was God when he came to earth, became man, born of woman, lived a perfectly moral, perfect, morally perfect life. And then, even though he in no way deserved to be punished for anything ever, he took on the punishment that we all deserve for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God. Now that all is all, all that is left now is for us to give glory to God, confess our sins, accept his mercy, and worship him as God, because he is. Anyway, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you came to us, became one of us, and that you died for us so that we could be reconciled to you, so you could wash our sins away continuously from then on with your blood. We thank you, we adore you, we acknowledge you as God. 
we ask that you let it always be, no matter what adversity we may have to face, for claiming you as our Savior. Let us go out in the world and proclaim you, Lord, into a sinful, desperate world that needs your love, your mercy. Let us proclaim you, Lord, in your name. Amen.